recording in progress. Um, are my slides showing up on your screen? Yes, they are. Yes. You may need to switch the presenter view. Uh, no, go Is back to where you were and then go to slide the show. Yeah, perfect. So you're seeing the slides or, or no? Uh, you, you, go to slide. Let me uh, yeah. reset it up, yeah. How about now? Perfect. Great. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Gidwani, and to the Institute for Critical Care Medicine. Um, I feel very grateful to have been given the chance to come here. And I, I hope that you appreciate that I was so excited to be part of Grand Rounds that I went straight to KCC6, and I was all set to do this in person. Uh, so I'm grateful to Dr. Gidwani for, uh, for helping to vamp for a few minutes uh, while I made it to a computer. Um, so um, I was asked to do a talk called ACC Wrap Up, and with your permission, I'd like to keep this very focused on some of the most high yield things that intensivists need to know. Is that all right with you all? Uh, but it goes without saying that the, uh, the prize created in Dr. Fuster's name, uh, I, I think that everybody in this audience uh, would agree that there's not a more deserving individual in the college and in the profession uh, to be recognized as such. Indeed, go ahead, sir. Um, so these are my disclosures, uh, neither of which is relevant to the composition today. Um, so I had the privilege of getting to go to Washington DC uh, to soak in some of the science uh, that I'm gonna share with you today. Uh, this was very exciting for the American College of Cardiology because it was the first time in a while that we actually were able to have an in-person meeting. And so it was a meeting that was packed with a lot of enthusiasm on the part of the people who are participating, uh, but also really endowed with some outstanding science, and in particular, a few examples of studies that really are going to be practice changing. So what I'd like to do over the next 40 to 45 minutes is this. At the end of this talk, I want you to be able to incorporate three lessons that come from the new science presented at ACC 2022 into your critical care practice. And it goes without saying that the volume of science presented at ACC was well beyond what can be contained within one of these talks. So what I would like is to invite you to decide which of these would be most interesting to you to start with first. And I'll take a suggestion. I think that you have thoughtfully arranged it in order of preference. So let's start with the reddest one. Fair enough, Dr. Giwani. So is there a way to provide our hyperkalemia prone heart failure patients with the benefit of renin angiotensin aldosterone system inhibitors? <clears throat> so take a case example that we may have encountered in our practices. So you have a 55-year-old man who's known to have a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, and he's admitted to the hospital with an acute decompensation of heart failure. He's diuresed, as per usual, and you start carvedilol and an SGLT2 inhibitor, and you want to continue to optimize guideline-directed medical therapy, but you learn that this patient has not been on any of the ACEs, ARBs, RNEs, or MRAs because of a past history of hyperkalemia. So what's the problem here? So I think that as we all appreciate, ACEs and ARBs, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists are essential components of our guideline directed medical therapies. And those who have read the most recent heart failure guidelines know that these represent two of the four cardinal groups of medical therapies for a chronic heart failure. Uh, and indeed, they're contributors to reduction in mortality over the lifespan, but, they're not without cost. If you look at the addition of the ACE inhibitors, as in the case of enalapro in the SOLVED trial, uh, 
uh, there was an incidence of about 8% of significant hyperkalemia. As for the mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, looking for example at spironolactone in the RAL study, there was a nearly 20% incidence of hyperkalemia. And when I say hyperkalemia, I'm talking about a potassium of 5.5 or greater. And as you can imagine, this is a common finding as illustrated here, and it also can become quite limiting and it alters practice patterns. Now, what are the consequences of this? Is it benign to simply stop the drugs in the hyperkalemic patients? So let's look at the data on that. So if you take patients with heart failure who have had an episode of significant hyperkalemia with spironolactone, for example, and you follow them out over time and you look at their heart outcomes, whether it's mortality or other heart to heart failure outcomes. So if you continue the mineral corticoid receptor antagonist versus if you don't uh, continue the mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, there's a significant excess in risk in those patients who have had to stop uh, indefinitely their MRA after a hyperkalemic episode. So it begs the question of, it's not a benign thing to become hyperkalemic. So can we potentially find some solutions so that we're not depriving these patients of these life-sustaining therapies? So enter the idea. We know that the mineral corticoid receptor antagonists in particular are making you prone to hyperkalemia by altering renal handling of potassium and preventing renal losses of potassium. So what if you took another approach to actually reduce potassium levels through binding in the gut. So if you take a potassium binder, perhaps that could offset the anticipated hyperkalemia with the mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. So this brings us to the notion behind the trial that I'm gonna discuss now. So what if you put together the potassium binder and the MRA, you might have less hyperkalemia, you might have more ability to remain on MRAs, and ultimately there might be reductions in heart outcomes. So this was the premise of the DIAMOND trial that was presented by Dr. Javed Butler at the ACC. So this was a study of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction of patients. Uh, they all had to have New York Heart Association class two to four symptomatology. They were already on beta blockers or had a good reason why they couldn't be on beta blockers. And they had had some hyperkalemia either presently or in the past. Um, there was an initial run-in phase where everybody began a potassium binder known as patiromer, uh, and then they had a chance to optimize their dosing of first an ACE or an ARB or ARNI, uh, and then a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. And then patients were randomized to either stay on the patiromer or to go to a placebo, and they were followed both for their electrolyte outcomes, their ability to stay on medical therapies, uh, as well as with interest in their clinical outcomes. Uh, so there's a design to the study looking at clinical outcomes in a hierarchical model, looking at death, cardiovascular hospitalization, uh, but also a fairly intricate system for looking at, at um, what might be considered to be a win on therapies. Are you on the therapies? Are you able to stay on the therapies at guideline directed maximal doses or not? And so how do the patients do? who got either the patiromer or the placebo. So for one thing, those patiromer treated patients had less of an increase in potassium over the course of the trial period, as might be expected. Um, they had a significantly lower likelihood of hyperkalemia as defined by a potassium of 5.5. Uh, and they were much less likely to have a below optimal dosage of the mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. Um, the study, as I said, also defined what it meant to be a win in terms of hyperkalemia outcomes in renin-angiotensin and dostroid inhibitor use, and it was a win on both counts. So in conclusion, the DIAMOND study, uh, as it was presented in ACC, showed that patiromer allowed 85% of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction patients with a history of hyperkalemia to actually receive guideline-directed doses of renin-angiotensin and aldosterone system inhibitors. Now, what we don't yet know, because it hasn't yet been presented and published, is whether these um, abilities to stay on therapy facilitated by the patiromer actually translates into heart outcomes. But that is the logical hypothesis based upon some of the observational data that I showed previously.
So key points from Diamond that you should take home. Number one, don't just deprive your heart failure patient of renin angiotensin aldosterone system inhibitors just because they've had an episode of hyperkalemia. They may actually be a good candidate for a potassium binder. Uh, and you can talk to the heart failure service on these patients to decide whether a concurrent strategy of both, uh, whether with pteromer or another binding alternative uh, may be appropriate. Any comments on diamond or questions? No, I guess we'll discuss the import of the ability to maximize GDMT when we at the towards the end of this talk. How's that? Any other questions or comments? So a second question that was touched upon by a uh, trial uh, at ACC was, is there an opportunity to reduce bleeding outcomes during non-cardiac surgery by giving transexamic acid? So another case example to lead in. So you have an 87-year-old woman who slips and falls on the pavement. And as a consequence of her fall, she develops hip fracture. Um, she has a past medical history of chronic kidney disease, hypertension, prior GI bleeding. And you obtain laboratory studies and note that her initial hematocrit is 29%. And just to add complexity, the patient consents to consideration of surgery, uh, but categorically does not consent to blood transfusions. So as I think most of us appreciate from our work, bleeding is quite common in non-cardiac surgery patients, uh, and it has adverse impact upon outcomes. So for example, in a multi-center series of over 16,000 cases of non-cardiac surgery, approximately 17% had significant perioperative bleeding. And if you looked at the mortality of those who died at 30 days, about 20 to 30% of that mortality was deemed to be attributable to bleeding or the aftermath of bleeding. So could we do better? And so the idea is this. So we all know our coagulation cascade. So things lead to activation of 10 to the tenase, which then catalyzes the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. Thrombin converts fibrinogen into fibrin. But balancing this, there's a fibrinolytic system. So we have plasminogen, which becomes activated by various activators into plasmin, uh, which is a protease, which can then cleave fibrin into fibrin split products, thereby lysing these fibrin plugs that comprise the clots that are forming within the bloodstream. And it's the dynamic balance between these two systems that allows us to maintain hemostasis without excessive clotting within the vessels. So the concept is, could you use an anti-fibrinolytic agent to alter the bleeding thrombosis risk balance during and in, in the immediate surround of surgery to reduce the risk of such bleeding? Uh, in the study in question at ACC, the study agent was transexamic acid. And again, the concept is that transexamic acid can reduce incident bleeding by inhibiting fibrinolysis. So this is not a new medicine. And I think those of us who spend time in trauma environments or cardiac surgical environments are likely already very familiar with its use. Uh, so the two major established indications uh, for transexamic acid that have been published uh, as valid applications include the trauma setting as well as cardiac surgery. Uh, with the recent paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, the ATACAS trial, which was a coronary surgery trial, showing that dosing of transexamic acid at the beginning and the end of a coronary surgery led to a significant reduction in both bleeding and transfusion events in the transexamic acid arm. Uh, notably in that study, there was no apparent excess in thrombosis or otherwise uh, ischemic events. Uh, and for what it's worth, to the extent that the patients undergoing coronary artery surgeries uh, 
are potentially among those at greatest jeopardy of thrombotic events, um, there's some signal perhaps towards safety in these cases uh, for the benefit uh, and the absence of thrombosis with transoxamic acid. But until now, there really was no study uh, rigorously examining the role of transoxamic acid in non-cardiac surgery. And that was the premise behind part of the POISE-3 study, which was presented at ACC. So POISE-3 was a randomized controlled trial. It was designed with a two-by-two two factorial design comparing uh, two comparison treatments. One of them was transoxamic acid versus placebo with a protocol comparable to that used for the coronary surgery study I mentioned. Uh, and it was a large study, nearly 10,000 patients that were randomized for that arm. Um, the second dimension of the two-by-two two factorial study was a comparison of a hypertension avoidance uh, strategy versus a hypotension avoidance strategy. Um, so with respect to transoxamic acid, one gram was administered at the beginning and at the end of surgery. There was 30-day follow-up with attention to both a primary efficacy outcome measure, which was a composite of different bleeding endpoints, as well as a primary safety outcome measure, which is a composite of cardiovascular events. Um, just more specifically, uh, the bleeding endpoint uh, was a sum of life-threatening bleeding, major bleeding, and bleeding into a critical organ, whereas the composite of cardiac events included myocardial injury, which includes both myocardial infarction and non-myocardial infarction injury, non-hemorrhagic strokes, and symptomatic proximal venous thromboembolism. So who was enrolled? Uh, it was a fairly representative study. 44% uh, of subjects in the study identified as female. Uh, the mean age of subjects was 70 years. Uh, in terms of the types of surgeries, 79% were either urgent or emergent. Uh, they had a mix of general surgery, orthopedic surgery, and vascular surgery, but died by design excluded patients with cranial neurosurgeries or cardiac surgeries. So what happened? In terms of bleeding events, uh, there was a significant reduction in the composite bleeding endpoint with transoxamic acid when compared with placebo. Uh, and this met criteria uh, designed a priori for superiority. With respect to the cardiac events, um, there was no gross numerical difference between the two. Uh, and the p-value for the difference was 0.04 this, however, did not satisfy the predefined criterion of 0 0.025 for non-inferiority. So as a result of this, what can be concluded from the trial was that transoxamic acid did reduce bleeding in non-cardiac surgery, but it was not yet possible to convincingly state whether or not there's safety from a thrombotic and cardiac event standpoint. Um, unclear, uh, looking at POISE-3, uh, was whether or not among these nearly 10,000 patients who are randomized, are there subsets within these groups that have a better calculus of bleeding reduction without excess risk of thrombosis? And this is conjecture and just for a hypothesis and discussion, but it may be worth looking at what some of the risk factors are for bleeding in non-cardiac surgeries. And I've listed six of them here. Uh, and whether identifying very high-risk bleeding candidates, uh, whether there is a greater delta between the, the benefits for anti-bleeding and the risk of thrombosis. Now, the caveat to that is that pretty much across trials, if you look at the factors that influence your risk profile for bleeding, there's often a substantial amount of overlap with your risk profile for thrombosis and thromboembolism. So it's not often as clean as saying, oh, this is a high bleeding risk, or this is a high thrombosis risk person. You often have a commingling of those risks. So in summary, uh, bleeding is common and it's consequential in non-cardiac surgery. And transexamic acid is an option that has been fairly well established now in the trauma and cardiac surgery fields. Uh, that now may potentially offer a way to reduce bleeding with non-cardiac surgery as well, with the caveat 
that we don't yet fully understand the safety profile in terms of cardiac events. So if it's going to be contemplated, I think that you need to factor in some awareness that there's potential for risk of excess thrombosis. Any comments on POIS-3? No, thank you very much. As you alluded to, at least in cardiac surgery and in cesarean section, we have evidence that thromboxin TXA transaminic acid reduces bleeding. And I remember an interview with uh, one of the cardiac surgeons, Dr. Chikwe, I don't know if you saw that. And she remarked that it was interesting that there wasn't greater use of TXA in other surgeries. Was that the point of this study? Or was the point that this study being presented at ACC was to look at whether it would affect particular cardiovascular outcomes? Because I know they had this composite outcome and then the secondary outcomes. Uh, I'm not certain that I understand the question that you're asking. So the question is, why was this presented at ACC? What was the point of this? Was it to demonstrate or uh, one of the, was one of the hypotheses that it would beneficially impact cardiovascular outcomes? Um, Myocardial infarction? Yeah. So I, I, I know of no a priori hypothesis that it would benefit cardiac outcomes directly anyway. Um, the primary rationale for the study was really to see, as you alluded to, why, why aren't we taking advantage of this anti-bleeding benefit of transexamic acid in a set of surgeries that absolutely can have bleeding? Um, you know, you could query whether uh, we didn't have the opportunity to ascertain a relevant signal. Um, or maybe the neutrality that was observed here in cardiovascular outcomes is true. Um, it simply didn't meet the statistical criteria for significance as defined. Uh, but I, I think the absolute numbers, as you see, are pretty negligible. So the main benefit of the addition of this evidence to our armamentarium would be maybe to encourage wider use of TXA in other surgeries besides CTS and C-section? So that's explicitly the, uh, I think the goal of, well, the, the goal of the authors and research team, of course, is to learn. But I think that based upon these results, they've been fairly strong in saying we should take more advantage of this. I think the only qualifier that I would put on that is that there are varying degrees of bleeding risk. And you know, perhaps for a subset of cases, the argument will be strongest to avail ourselves of something that's a favorable risk profile. Um, to the extent that it was presented at a cardiovascular meeting, uh, I would merely point out that it's, it's quite common that cardiology is engaged in the preoperative risk stratification of patients. And part of that is reducing risk of cardiovascular events, but importantly, Really, the role of the cardiologist in assessing the preoperative patient is assessing the risk of death. And as was shown in some of the observational literature that I presented in the preamble, um, there are many things that can kill you after non cardiac surgery. And cardiac events are some of them, but some of them are, in fact, attributable to the bleeding that occurs. So I think the more that, as preoperative risk stratifiers, we can take a holistic view of risk in the perioperative period, the more likely we are to reduce risk of mortality. Fair enough. Thank you. Any other comments from the group? We have people from such a broad array of intensive care units. I'd love some, some additional comments.
So the, the final question that I'll address that was touched upon in a substantial way at ACC concerned hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the question is, in those patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, who have exhausted traditional modes of medical therapy, uh, and in particular for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, is there anything left that we can do short of recommending the patients undergo septal reduction therapies? So as a case example, you have a 48-year-old man who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a 23 millimeter septum. He has been managed through the years, prescribed beta blocker. He's also on a calcium channel blocker at this point. And as a practical matter, the doses of those have really been maximized. The heart rate is now in the, the low to mid 50s. Blood pressure is marginal. He started to complain of much more fatigue. Um, now walking down the street, he becomes short of breath and lightheaded, merely walking one block goes for an echocardiogram. And among other things, there's measurement of a left ventricular outflow tract gradient of 30 millimeters of mercury at rest that then increases with an exercise treadmill test to 65 millimeters of mercury with exercise. And he returns for follow-up after the echocardiogram and asks you, you know, have we reached that point where it's time to talk about some kind of septal reduction therapy? So a word about the problem. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is much more common than I think that many of us realize, an underdiagnosed entity that if you look rigorously, occurs in one in 200 to one in 500 individuals in the population. Now, not all hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Some, but not all patients will have obstruction at the level of the left ventricular outflow tract. It typically results from uh, uh, generally a lack of space occurring between the thickened interventricular septum, as well as the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, which can move anteriorly during systole is something called SAM. When this obstruction becomes severe, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction can bring about an array of symptoms, which are fairly familiar from cardiac disease in general, but dyspnea, chest pain, syncope, and arrhythmias, among which include not only atrial fibrillation and other atrial arrhythmias, but also ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. So as mentioned, we do have medications which have been used for many years, including beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and disopyramide, which is really a class 1A antiarrhythmic. But the issue is that none of these was really perfectly or rationally designed for the explicit purpose of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with obstruction in particular. Uh, the medicines have pleiotropic effects, uh, which at best can be unpleasant and at worst can actually induce risk, even risks of arrhythmias and death in certain cases. Uh, so, it's an imperfect science, and it's certainly an incomplete armamentarium to just have these medicines. So traditionally, when these medicines, when maximized, have failed to adequately relieve left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, that's when conversation about septal reduction therapy has come up. So when I say septal reduction therapy, we're talking broadly about something to literally mechanically debulk the amount of meat that's in the left ventricular outflow tract. Uh, the two options for this historically have included surgical myectomy, um, and which has a fair amount of experience now, but has been around not quite as long, septal ablation. <clears throat> so I presented here some of the pros and cons of these two approaches and how we may think about them comparatively when treating a patient. <clears throat> so surgical myectomy, of course, is an open heart surgery. Uh, and with that comes all the attendant potential complications and risks of an open heart surgery procedure. Septal ablation in contrast is a cath lab procedure. And so the upfront procedural risk profile and preparations tend to be less so uh, than they would for an open heart surgery. Uh, this is not to say, however, that it's a procedure without risks, so let's say in a moment. Surgical myectomy has traditionally been felt to be superior for patients with particularly bulky left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, 
whereas septal ablation tends to be superior for those with relatively thinner, albeit thickened septums in the 16 to 25 millimeter range. Um, surgical myectomy is a technique that requires a sizable amount of expertise. Uh, and for this reason, there are really is selected centers around the country and around the world where there's the surgical expertise to do this at an excellent level. Uh, septal ablation is perhaps a little bit more democratic in so much as that the results tend to be more reproducible across centers. And in this regard, it may be relatively more accessible than a reference septal myectomy surgeon. Uh, myectomy, as I said, is older with a greater uh, length of data available, whereas ablation is relatively newer. And a word about how septal ablation is performed, typically what happens is that you do uh, uh, left heart catheterization as you would for any other coronary angiogram. And in the same spirit as which you might perform a PCI, you're going to be injecting a desiccating alcohol into a specific septal branch of the left anterior descending artery with the intention to produce a targeted myocardial infarction in that area. Uh, now, like any other myocardial infarction, this is going to produce an elevated troponin, it's gonna produce pain, uh, and importantly, it's gonna produce scar and fibrosis. This is another arena in which septal ablation and surgical myectomy have been compared uh, with uh, some arguing that it's a reason for the relative inferiority of septal ablation as a procedure in so much as that it leads the patient with a greater burden of resultant fibrosis and scarring. And as we know, ventricular arrhythmias are a major concern in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then the final comment I'll make is that both of these procedures jeopardize the conducting system and characteristically surgical myectomy runs a risk of a new left bundle branch block whereas septal ablation runs a risk of a new right bundle branch block. So these have served the community well and continue to, but the question is, would there be an opportunity with a different approach medicinally to mitigate the gradient that might potentially not only improve symptoms, but stave off the need to go to surgery? So here's the idea. So, Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is really a disease of muscle, but importantly, not just the actual thickness of the muscle, but actually the behavior of the muscle. And a hypercontractility of ventricular myocardium is increasingly appreciated as a major mediator of the obstruction that occurs in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So we have a new drug now called Mavicamptin. This is a small molecule that functions to inhibit beta cardiac myosin. And in doing so, it directly inhibits the sarcomere force output. Uh, that number one ends up in a reduction in contractility, but importantly, it actually also allows for an increase in the compliance of the left ventricle. Um, there's been some evidence already existing to date about Mavicamptin and this coming from some phase two as well as early phase three trials. So what we've already seen in this published evidence is that Mavicamptin results in a reduction in left ventricular outflow tract gradients. It leads to an improvement in exercise tolerance as measured uh, systematically, but also in terms of how patients report their feelings. And that's measured in improvements in New York Heart Association or functional classification as well as patient reported outcomes in the setting of their hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And there's a decrease in dyspnea symptom scores uh, reported by patients in questionnaires. Uh, but until now, it hasn't been proven that with use of Mavicamptin, you could actually potentially uh, get patients feeling so much better and improve the obstruction by so much that they wouldn't even need a septal reduction therapy anymore. So this was the premise behind the Valor HCM study, which was one of the major, major studies presented with ACC. So this was the flowchart for the study and I'll focus in. Uh, it wasn't a huge study, but it was big enough. They had 112 patients who were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to receive either Mavicamptin or placebo. The mean age of patients studied was 60 years old and it was about half and half uh, female and male uh, subjects. Um, to enter the study, uh, the subjects had to have a left ventricular outflow tract of greater 
equal to or greater than 50 millimeters of mercury. And that could either be at rest or with a provocative intervention such as a Valsalva maneuver or exercise. And importantly, they needed to be effectively maximized on medical therapy. So the concept here was you've done everything that you could do with traditional medicines, you still have a significant gradient, you're still significantly symptomatic, and you're actually coming for a referral and consultation for a septal reduction therapy. Um, over the span of the weeks that followed randomization, uh, including very, very frequent transthoracic echocardiograms designed to measure both changes in the gradient and changes in left ventricular ejection fraction, uh, the drug was actively titrated through the trial period uh, with clinical outcomes reported in ACC up to 16 weeks. So the major question in the study was, would you actually change the number of patients that needed to either proceed with septal reduction therapy or were otherwise guideline eligible for septal reduction therapy and perhaps hadn't had it yet. So in the Mavicampton arm, 17.9% fit this criteria, whereas 76.8% in the placebo arm. This is a huge difference uh, in this primary composite endpoint uh, of the study. In terms of some of the other outcome measures, looking at functional classification, the degree of gradient, as well as symptom scores, there were significant differences observed favoring Mavicampton in each of these four categories. And these were consistent with a preceding study called the Explorer study. Uh, how about safety? So, Ventricular tachycardia uh, was not more common in the Mavicampton arm. If anything, it was numerically less. Uh, there did seem to be more nausea with Mavicampton. And within the time frame of this study, there was no incident chronic heart failure, syncope, or sudden cardiac death. Now, caveat is that as a small molecule inhibitor of myosin, we know that Mavicampton has the potential to decrease contractility. And so a major worry and concern with the monitoring of the drug is to make sure that there has been no reduction in left ventricular rejection fraction. Uh, and indeed, as I'll say in a moment, uh, the drug has recently become available for clinical use. Prescribing and dispensing of the medicine is incredibly rigorous uh, in the requirements for uh, patient updates, for logging and monitoring of echocardiogram findings. Uh, and for uh, having very specific provisions if the ejection fraction should ever drop below 50%. So in summary, uh, in patients with symptomatic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and persistent left ventricular outflow tract obstruction despite maximal medical therapy, this was a huge win for Mavicampton. It significantly reduced the need for septal reduction therapy and compatible and consistent with that, there were substantial differences in this resultant gradient at the left ventricular outflow tract, as well as patient symptoms and functional classification. So take away that Mavicampton is a promising new option to treat hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, uh, but be aware that there's a substantial complexity of monitoring and titration, and these may ultimately be barriers to both the adoption, the implementation, the access and the equity of access to this agent uh, as it rolls out to the market. So closing out a discussion of these three studies, I want you to take away the following points for your critical care medicine practice. So first, don't deprive your heart failure patients of renin angiotensin system uh, inhibitors just because they've had hyperkalemia before you discontinue or stop permanently or write as an allergy in a chart, make sure that the patients might not be good candidates for a combination of these agents with a potassium binder. Secondly, I think that POISE 3 put transexamic acid on the map as a potential option for patients undergoing non-cardiac surgeries. It's not a slam dunk because we don't know with certainty yet that there's no risk of thrombotic and ischemic cardiac events. But with that said, there was a fairly clear signal toward reduction in significant bleeding in the perioperative period after non-cardiac surgery. So it's worth a careful look uh, 
and especially at those subgroups that potentially will stand to benefit the most in terms of net clinical benefit. And then finally, I encourage you to consider mavacamptin as a new tool in the toolkit for treating your patient with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. It may provide us with a way to avoid invasive therapies like septal ablation or septal myectomy for those patients who would otherwise be considering septal reduction therapy. So I'll pause there with my prepared material and I wanna to open to the group for any comments, questions, and discussion. I encourage our colleagues to think about this excellent presentation and engage with Dr. Tommy on what I'm sure are a lot of interesting issues that you may have uh, you know, in your mind about the appropriate use of certain drugs, et cetera. Dr. Tommy, thank you so much for such a succinct presentation that has laid out some of the current developments in cardiology that are germane to critical care as well. While people get their guts or courage up a little bit to discuss, just a comment on the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy drug, the first in class myosin inhibitor that was approved in April of this year. I know that there was a lot of excitement, but also a little bit of trepidation, some of which was addressed and some of which was not. In your experience, what do you think has been the uptake of this medication? Because of course, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can sometimes be a little bit of frustrating type of heart failure to manage. Um, it's very early. I think that there's probably, at this point, minimal clinical uptake. Um, I, I don't think that that speaks to what there will be, but I will say um, there are a number of hoops that you need to jump through before you can even set up a prescribing program. So there's a, a certification process known as a REMS program. So it goes by CAMSIOS is the trade name for it. And so there is a so-called CAMSIOS REMS program, which has a quite rigorous uh, system. Number one, for verifying prescribers, you need to go through a course and actually take a test to be a, a prescriber of it. And the emphasis is really on rigorously understanding the expected frequency of echocardiograms, which is really unlike anything else that we're routinely prescribing in cardiology, um, and understanding some of the paperwork expectations. There are multiple hard stops built into the system so that whether at the prescriber or at the pharmacy level, if there's anything missing, there won't be a risky dispensing of the agent. Um, in particular, the concern is for incident systolic heart failure. Uh, and this is the, there's a black box warning from the FDA concerning this and it's the rationale for the REMS program. Uh, but I think that we're gonna need to learn more once we get into a post-marketing phase, you know, what is the true incidence of this in real world practice where some of the, you know, the discipline that's perhaps more readily available within a clinical trial setting can be more challenging to execute in practice. Really? Now on the flip side, there may be practices that are actually quite excellent at this. And we're gonna see, I think ultimately perhaps some differences in clinical outcomes and clinical benefits based upon the, the discipline of the practice prescribing it. Yeah, very exciting, right? To have this new, totally new class of drugs emerge in the past two or three years. Yeah. Okay. Having uh, no further questions, I would just like to comment a few comments. I'm looking for volunteers 
to review, preferably those who've attended the conference, the seminal work presented at the important national meetings and present it to this audience so that we can disseminate some of the latest science that is occurring uh, you know, as the year passes. So the neurology, the cardiac surgery, cardiology, liver, mm -hmm. medical, surgical, mm -hmm. and neuro groups. Uh, if you can volunteer to review your important uh, conferences uh, and present it at this forum, I would be very thankful. That's one. Number two, this is a very open group and I invite everyone to recommend speakers. Uh, we are nearing the end of this season. I can't remember now, it's probably season seven, six or seven or eight of these constituted grand rounds under ICCM. Um, and you know we've developed a few themes and I invite people to suggest new themes, new fora, and importantly, new speakers um, and also be, uh, you know, to survey the recent journals uh, to contact speakers for uh, next season's uh, grand rounds, which will begin right after Labor Day in September. So we still have several very interesting conferences coming up. And I thank you for your attendance. And I thank once again, our faculty that is internal, such as Dr. Tommy and others who have spoken and encourage others to speak as well. Anyone has any comments, questions? Okay, thank you. I will bring this session to a close and I thank you very much again, Dr. Tommy.